Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And I'd like to start things off with a leak for AMD and two upcoming processors. No, these are not Zen 3, but they are still extremely interesting, in my opinion, for budget-focused builders. And they are two Ryzen 3 processors, the 3300X and also the 3100. Both are quad-core parts with SMT enabled, but the pricing of these processors looks to be around 100 to 140 US dollars. So let's quickly go over the specifications. The 3300X, as I mentioned, is a 4-core, 8-thread processor, which can boost up to 4300 MHz. And this puts it around 300 MHz faster than the 2300, the Ryzen 3 2300, and of course also benefits for the Zen 2 architecture as well. Furthermore, the chip is outfitted with 18 megabytes of total cache. And the bottom of the stack would be the Ryzen 3 3100. As I mentioned, it's the bottom of the stack, but still features SMT. Four cores, eight threads, but the clock frequency is just 3900 MHz. But we can expect this chip to be around 100 US dollars, which I'm sure you'll agree is pretty damn amazing. I mean, yes, it's not as impressive as, say, a Ryzen 9 3950X with its ridiculous 16 cores, 32 threads. But even so, we can assume that this will still support uh, PCIe uh, Generation 4. And we can also assume that it will be usable on just about any AM4 motherboard, which means it's a really nice option if you want to build like a smaller form factor system, maybe like to take around friends' houses. Well, not quite now with the current situation, but you get my point. Like if you want to build a smaller form factor system, and then you can outfit that with a reasonably powerful uh, discrete GPU, something like uh, an RTX 2060, or if you wanted to go the AMD route, you could potentially go like the RX 5600 or something like that, and then you have a really powerful system, but it can also serve as the bare bones for someone who wants to get into PC gaming. And four cores, eight threads, yes, it's not as uh, capable in games as, let's say, a 3700X, but even so, most titles now still don't fully leverage all of the CPU cores and threads of a modern um, processor. I actually investigated this much more with a recent core count scaling video. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. What's quite interesting here, while it, whereas the specifications were discovered by Momomo on Twitter, so of course I'll link that in the video description, Jim over at Adore TV recently had an article up on his website, and according to what he's learned, the chip itself is a single CCX. So if you're unfamiliar with the Zen 2 architecture, generally speaking, there are two CCXs on a single chiplet. So basically, obviously, uh, this means you've got eight cores total per chiplet, so those cores are split amongst the two CCXs, so each CCX has four cores. But with this particular line of chips, it looks like you don't have the additional CCX. It's only a single CCX on the processor. So essentially, there are some questions of how the IO die would work, because IO dies for the Zen 2 lineup for, Z for Ryzen 3000, of course, are separate. So you have the chiplet, which contains the uh, eight processor cores, and then you have a I.O. die, which handles things like communicating with the memory, PCIe, and so on and so on. And if you have a higher core count processor, let's say the 3900 or the 3950X, it also facilitates communication between the two chiplets. Whereas this, once again, it's only four cores. So there's a question of whether it's a monolithic die, i.e. the memory controller, and well, I guess you could say the entire communication is now essentially part of the CCX, or whether it's still a separate component. It being integrated would make sense in that it would be more like Renault 
So obviously that would have probably meant there's quite a lot of redesign that AMD would have had to do. So perhaps that's one of the reasons we're seeing the lower end uh, Ryzen 3000s kind of come out now. Uh, obviously it coincides with Renault, but that's just speculation on my part. You may be familiar with DirectX 12 Ultimate, which of course is DirectX 12, albeit with several very important pieces of technology bolted on. Ray tracing, variable rate shading, mesh shading, and sampler feedback are all imperative for not just PC gaming, of course, but also the next generation Xbox. So I've gone fairly in-depth into DirectX 12 Ultimate in a separate video, but... There is a new driver update from NVIDIA which will allow them to start messing around with DirectX 12 Ultimate features. Now to be clear here, this is only currently available for NVIDIA because AMD's RDNA 2 chips are not in public hands. So this means that developers can't start messing around with RDNA 2 features and RDNA 1 does not support features like variable rate shading and also does not support features like ray tracing. Nevertheless, NVIDIA are here with the 450.82 drivers. It's a very simple numbering scheme and absolutely makes perfect logical sense to everyone inside of NVIDIA at least. This is the first NVIDIA drivers to officially support DirectX 12 Ultimate. Well, the first drivers that officially have come out of their laboratories anyway. And this API, once again, is designed specifically for developers. So you shouldn't really rush out and be concerned about this if you're just uh, playing the games rather than developing them. But this is still extremely uh, important for us as gamers because it means that developers now have access to being able to actually develop titles which fully take advantage of all of these features. I know a lot of limelight is uh, on the uh, ray tracing functionality of the next generation cards and it certainly is extremely impressive and there's also lots of discussion about variable rate shading but honestly, mesh shading, as well as sampler feedback, are, to me anyway, the hidden champions here. Ray tracing looks extremely uh, pretty. I mean, without question, a game which runs ray tracing looks amazing. And obviously, we've seen now that the beta of uh, Minecraft RTX is out, and it does look pretty amazing, given it's fully path traced, which of course is a more advanced form of ray tracing. And variable rate shading allows specific areas of the scene to be shaded at lower detail settings. This is once again imperative of saving GPU performance and then putting it into things which are more important, such as objects or the monster that's chewing your face in front of you. But sampler feedback allows the game engine, as well as the developer, to understand what MIP level a texture is loading into memory at. So obviously textures are created with a variety of different MIP levels. MIP, by the way, essentially means detail level. So obviously you've got the higher resolution textures, let's say 4K, all the way down to low resolution textures. And then depending on your proximity to the object and so on and so on, you will be able to either increase or decrease the resolution of the texture. The problem is, up until now, it's been extremely difficult to ascertain or that matter the game engine to ascertain what level of uh, detail is actually required. So this means that actually optimizing your game engine to fully leverage the memory the best it can has been rather difficult. And make no mistake about it, sampler feedback is going to be imperative for the next generation of games because of course as detail levels go up, memory requirements also increase as well. And because you don't have infinite memory, being able to pr uh, properly predict what MIP level, what detail level of textures you will need, and then get ready to load them in from your storage device into system memory is going to be extremely important. I've also discussed mesh shading before a few times, but it basically is a feature which allows the GPU to run the geometry pipeline as kind of like a compute shader, which is much more how, of course, a GPU really functions under the hood. Uh, as I mentioned, I've gone a lot more in depth into this stuff before in why DirectX 12 is so important for not only the uh, Xbox, but PC. But 
This will also mean for you to fully leverage these drivers, assuming you are a developer. You will also need the latest Direct, uh, sorry, Windows 10 version, the 20 uh, H1 update, but this is not going to roll out until next month. And uh, Microsoft today, though, have actually released the final May 2020 update uh, preview, so you can download that if you so desire. Also, a smaller piece of news, but still related to Microsoft. According to Brad Sams on his uh, YouTube channel, I'll link the video in the description of this one, Microsoft will be hosting two events for the next generation Xbox, but he doesn't know what will be revealed. And one will be in May, the other will be in June. This is very similar to the scuttlebutt that's been circulating the internet for the last week or so. To be honest, I think you could probably throw a uh, dart at a board and probably kind of guess this yourself in the... Of course, there were events planned for around E3 anyway, and given that there is a console waiting to be launched, it doesn't really take a genius to figure out that there would be something that Microsoft would want to um, put into the public eye around May slash June time. The thing is, though, at the moment we don't know what will actually be shown off. Will we finally know, for example, what the pricing of the Xbox Series X is, or will we see Lockhart, if Lockhart is even real, because clearly there is a lot of confusion over that. Some people swear that it is definitely real, others swear that no, there's no way in hell Microsoft would release this, because it would create too much marketing confusion. At the end of the day, of course, only folks inside of Microsoft actually know this for certain. Um, so, it'll be really interesting what happens in May. I kind of expect Microsoft to stagger announcements, to be honest. Um, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that they'll probably want to keep the hype up as much as possible, and uh, I suspect that the PR war with Sony is going to only intensify as the uh, year progresses, because I think Microsoft this time around are a lot more competitive. With the last generation, to be really honest with you, Sony just kind of stomped them in every single way possible. They had a better console in terms of design. They obviously didn't have the whole online DRM fiasco, and they also didn't have people freaking out about Connect, because at the end of the day, there were a lot of people who had misgivings about the privacy of Connect, and I think that's kind of funny to be honest, given how many people now have the. I was about to say the word, but I don't want to kind of trigger lots, lots of people's uh, devices. But the device from Amazon, who I can't uh, say the word, uh, sorry, the name of, but still, I just kind of think it's funny how Microsoft have uh, Connect, uh, and then lots of people are concerned about privacy, and now at this point, even your grandma has the Amazon device. And a small update to a video I released yesterday concerning the price of the PlayStation 5 being perhaps more expensive than what uh, Sony had hoped for. Indeed, there are reports that the console could cost around 500 to 550 US dollars for Sony to break even. Well, there's a small update thanks to an analytics and data firm by the name of Ampere Analysis. I'm sure NVIDIA are rolling their eyes at yet another company using the Ampere name. Anyway, according to them, the consoles, the next generation consoles, will probably cost around 450 to 500 US dollars. And this is a direct quote. We expect the new Sony and Microsoft consoles to be launched in November 2020 if they are not delayed due to component supply shortages or game development bottlenecks. And we can expect the launch price to be 450 to 499 and we expect it is inevitable that a recession will undermine sales to an extent, but any impact will be more significantly felt later in 2021 once the initial early adopter launch surge ends. As both next generation consoles will support backwards compatibility, and most new third party games over the next 18 months will also support the older generation of consoles. Consumers impacted by a downturn may not feel they need to upgrade as early as they may have, end quote. I said in yesterday's video that in many ways, Microsoft's ecosystem is probably a little bit more robust here because for first party games, people know that, yes, naturally the Xbox Series X will have far superior graphics to what's available in the current generation, but you at least know that the new Halo, or whatever other games are released, 
will run on your Xbox One. And of course, you've also got PC opportunities as well. I know most people who uh, watch this channel are PC gamers at least somewhat. So there's definitely that as a benefit. If you've got even a reasonably competent PC, even if you don't own an Xbox One, eh, you can still play Halo Infinite. It may not look as good on the Xbox One as compared to Xbox Series X, but at least you can play it. With the PlayStation 5, it seems like Sony have this, like, wall. So PS4 games are PS4 games, PS5 games are PS5 games, but uh, you do have backwards compatibility, which means that there may be a greater force for people to upgrade to the PlayStation 5, but then again, it's all going to really depend on prices. I'm going to be fascinated to see how all of this plays out, because, well, it really depends on who you believe in terms of financial uh, analytics. Some people believe that uh, the economic downturn is going to be vastly overplayed, and honestly, it's not really going to be that big of a deal in several months, but then, of course, it all depends on uh, just how fast we can get things back to normal. Anyways, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully, you've enjoyed it. The normal stuff, if you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.